Good evening, everyone. Happy 2021. Happy Black History Month. Welcome back to Conversation Starters, Black Doctoral Network episode. We are going to be talking about a wonderful topic this evening, and I'm thrilled you all could join us. It's entitled Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. I want to go ahead and jump right in. We have some expert panelists that will be joining us this evening to share their insights into this topic and how it affects the academic setting. The first panelist joining us this evening is Dr. Lorenzo Boy, who currently is the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of New Haven. With his 14 years of experience as Deputy Sheriff in Boston, it has informed his 20 years in the higher education system, where he focuses on professional development training with a central focus on building levels of empathy, lived experience, and cultural competence among police personnel and community members. I welcome you, Dr. Boyd. Thank you very much. Our second panelist joining us this evening is Dr. Vicki T. Sapp, who currently is the Director of Student Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion, and Assistant Professor at the Department of Medical Education at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, also the Senior Consultant at Deal With It Management, LLC. With her 20 years in higher education experience, she has focused on first-generation students of color, college access, retention, success, social justice and diversity, equity and inclusion, and a plethora of healthcare topics. I welcome you, Dr. Stapp. Good evening and happy uh, Black History Month. Glad Thank to be here. Wonderful. Our next panelist joining us this evening is Dr. Terrence Mitchell, who is a Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Edinburgh University, also the Special Assistant to the President for Diversity and Inclusion at Slippery Rock University. With 30 years in higher education, he's focused on a variety of areas with regard to diversity affairs, student activities, leadership programs, scholarship allotment, academic discipline, grant management, and campus security. I welcome you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Next panelist joining us this evening is Dr. Devin Horton, who is currently the Graduate Diversity Officer for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics at UC Davis. With her 10 years of experience in teaching and program development, she provides leadership to deans, faculty, academic programs, academic senate committee, and administrative units to develop and implement recruitment and retention strategies to eliminate barriers for graduate students and postdoc scholars from marginalized populations. I welcome you, Dr. Horton. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. And finally, we have joining us Dr. Ashley Campbell, who currently is the manager of user security and data integrity within the Office of Human Resources at the University of Rochester. With her 10 years of experience in progressive higher education for and for profit, her areas of focus include ethnic psychology, speculative fiction, and television media. I welcome you, Dr. Campbell. Welcome, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm thrilled and excited to be discussing this topic because I believe it's something that we often overlook or it just becomes a norm. And there's so many areas that we definitely need to explore. So I wanna go ahead and jump right into some of these questions that I have for you all. The first question that I have is, how would you describe the relationship between diversity, inclusion, and higher education? Dr. Sam. You know, when I hear that question, I think of the first thing that came to mind for me is a marriage, right? And, and when we talk about diversity, inclusion, and higher education, I think that some of us at our institutions are, is a perfect marriage. We're all in the honeymoon stage. We're still doing things. We're recruiting. We're creating access. 
We're making sure that our students feel included in our programmatic initiatives and student engagement, as well as in the academic um, arena. And then some institutions are estranged. They recruit and they have nothing on campus for the students. Some uh, institutions are separated. They're not looking at policies, procedures, and practices. I call it my five P's, the policy, procedure, practices, protocol, and um, I always forget one, and uh, um, process. And really being able to look at all of that to make sure that diversity and inclusion is there, individuals are at the table. And so when we look at these different institutions, we're looking at a marriage, either it's a perfect marriage, an estranged marriage, separation, or they're just divorced and they're not even on the radar of understanding diversity inclusion and how the relationship should be in higher education. No, thank you for your thoughts. And I like the five Ps. Uh, we definitely need to hear you say that again um, for our audience members. Um, Dr. Boyd, what are your thoughts? I think the relationship is a tumultuous relationship at best because a lot of institutions say that they want diversity and they preach levels of inclusion, but a lot of them don't know what it is because many of the people in higher ed are used to the people like them. So when faculty members are recruiting, they recruit their friends. When administrators are looking for other people, they look for people that they know. So there's still a lot of good old boy network um, happening. So on occasion, they will bring in a bunch of people of color and decide that we can handle the recruitment part. And they do really well with recruitment. But when people get there, there's no affinity groups. There's no mentoring. There's nothing to keep people there, which is why we see so many PhDs of color moving around from institution to institution. So although they say they want uh, diversity and inclusion, and many of them may believe it, unfortunately, a lot of folks don't know how to achieve it. Thank you. And that just highlights the implementation process. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Campbell, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with um, my colleagues um, who've already spoken, but one of the biggest things that I've, I've come to terms with is, you know, there's an out of order, or as we say in um, an African spirituality tradition, it's we're out of my eye. Right. So you have individuals um, like us who are melanated, black and brown, um, who see the words diversity, equity and inclusion. And we automatically have certain definitions and understandings as to what that means and what we're looking for. However, mainstream culture has a very different understanding of that. Right. So diversity for them in most cases is a numerical value. Right. So what are our numbers? Right. And that's all that the focus is on um, when we get to inclusion. Then it's like, well, visually, we're doing what we got to do. Right. So the, the academic spaces actually look diverse. Um, but then once we get to that equity piece, it's kind of like, mm, I'm not sure what that actually means. Oh, I think we're supposed to do this or that because the Department of Labor requires us to report out on certain things. So I guess we're kind of hitting the mark when it comes to de &I. So. For me, when I think about this question, it's more so about we have to first recognize what how we are interpreting um, what that relationship is and understanding that mainstream culture has a very different way of how they understand what DEI is and how it actually uh, manifests in the higher education space. Thank you. Thank you for breaking it down like that. Um, Dr. Horton, what are your thoughts? Sure. So, uh, of course, I echo my colleagues' um, thoughts on this. I want to add to that that when I think about the relationship between DEI um, and institutions of higher education, it often feels like an add-on um, where the approach is to add on uh, these ideas about diversity, equity, and inclusion, often with the majority of the attention being paid to diversity, um, to my most recent Dr. Campbell's point, um, that it's much more about the numbers as opposed to equitable access and inclusive engagement, right? And um, I think that oftentimes when institutions think of DEI or the D as an add-on, they don't realize that unless you weave diversity, equity, and inclusion into the very fabric of your institutions, the changes that you attempt to implement are going to be temporary at best. 
um, and appear disingenuous to those populations who you claim to serve at, at worst. So my two cents. Your thoughts. Um, Dr. Mitchell. I think you're muted. I just said I'm the oldest person in the group, so I don't know how to do the mute. <laughs> so uh, I love what everybody had to say. And so I really like that marriage thing. I'm going to use it. I'm going to claim it, but I'm going to I'm going to say it. I got it from somebody else, from Dr. Sapp. <laughs> uh, so like a marriage to me, diversity is like uh, you got to be in it for the long haul, you know, and every once in a while you got to stop and renew your vows, you know, and, that, and that's something that's hard for presidents to understand. I was talking to our president, one of our presidents today, and I said, um, I said, look, so we're going to do this plan, we're gonna do this huge plan. It's going to go really well. And then three years from now, we got to do it again. And he was like, no, I said, yeah. I said, and then three years from then, we got to do it again. So that's one piece of it. The other piece I really connected with was um, ask us so you can do better. You know, instead of, you know, um, uh, Dr. Campbell, I was thinking about, you know, I don't often get asked what I, what I know or what work or what work needs to be done. I get told what tasks need to happen. And diversity at conclusion is not about tasks. It's about thoughtful and intentional work that's going to impact the campus, you know, imp impact your campus. The other thing I think about, because all of you taught me something just then, we're constantly learning from each other. That's the one thing that we have in common, those of us who do diverse work. We're always learning from each other. And if everybody else learned from us, we would make some real progress. You know, and in Pennsylvania, diversity to me is um, the task. Inclusion and equity is the actual work. You know, so I'm not as concerned about the numbers on the campuses. I, I work on rural campuses. We're not going to have big numbers, but that work that we do with, with those young people, that work that we do with those faculty and staff, that's the important work. That's that's diversity, equity, inclusion work to me. It's so interesting because what it brought up for me just listening to you, because I'm in Pennsylvania as well, is really thinking about there's going to be a number of spaces where we're not going to have the numbers. So mm -hmm. does that mean we don't do diversity and inclusion work on those campuses? Absolutely not. We right. need to do that work because these individuals who are securing these degrees are going to be going out into the public and they're going to be hiring individuals. And if we don't teach these individuals how to navigate and understand that it's not only about the numbers or how many diverse students you have on your campus, Every institution needs to know how to infuse diversity inclusion, even with the coursework and understanding that that's important to educate. Where else are they going to learn this information if they're not doing it in K-12? So if they can get to college and they begin to start working in industries and they begin to start looking at how can they make their um, industries, their companies, their business more diverse, they need to be educated on that. I'm sorry. I know we're doing questions, but I, I want this to be oh. a dialogue as well. And I am learning nuggets from you all as well. I love diversity as a task. The work is actually doing inclusion and a sense of belonging. Really doing that work is very important. No, thank you, Dr. Seppin. This is what it's about, um, sharing ideas and thoughts and informing our audience members, because a lot of times they might not really understand exactly what diversity is and may see it in plain form but may not understand what it is in action. So this is why we're doing this. So I really appreciate uh, the conversation. So the next question that I have for you all is, what are some benefits and challenges in the promotion of diversity and inclusion in academia? I want to start with Dr. Campbell. Well, for me, I see, and, it, it, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, um, but I see more of the challenges than I do see the benefits. Um, I do think institutions are doing a great job in terms of really trying to implement strategic plans, um, really trying to be more methodical with their programming. But one of the biggest challenges I still come into contact with is at the end of the day, and I believe even Dr. Horton had alluded to this, what is your, what is your framework? You know, how are you actually building the, the, the overarching idea of what DEI is going to be for your institution? And are you going to, as Dr. Mitchell said, are we going to renew these vows every so often um, and be committed to the marathon, not necessarily the sprint? So that's that's the, the issue I'm having just in not necessarily being a Debbie Downer with understanding that there are challenges and benefits in you know the promotion of DEI at, at, in academia, but really recognizing that 
you know, we've made some footsteps, but we, we still got a whole lot of whole lot more work to do. <laughs> yes. No, thank you. And, so and, and I'm, I'm coming in again. And not only the framework. Right. But really the accountability and responsibility. Right. Beginning to look at these job descriptions and putting it in put people's performance program, beginning to have it weigh something and count for something and people being called out and held accountable for doing the work. If they're not doing the work, why they're not doing the work and also responsibility, not just giving it or putting it on the shoulders of the people of color. But everyone could carry this weight. Right. Everyone it's a, it's enough work for everyone. Let me tell you, there's enough work for everyone. And it shouldn't just be on the person of color that this one person that you get in. I forgot who talked about mentorship programs and making sure that, you know, when we look at promotion and tenure and who's being promoted, who's being um, tenured, that's also important, but also having mentorship to be able to give people and show them how to do it. Especially when we begin to talk about first generation college students, they're graduating and they're entering the um, academia for the first time and not knowing how to navigate because they're the first ones who have done it. Or do we have wraparound services support, not only for the faculty and staff of color, but also the students, right? And so really looking at that and using some of those pipeline programs that we have for the students, using that for the faculty and staff. So we don't always have to renew our vows. We don't have to forget what we have done. It's as if this, after four years, we start and again, just like the students come in for four years and they leave, maybe even six years, but they leave faculty rotation as well. And I'm going to try to shut up. I'm going to try to shut up. But this is no. good. This is good. <laughs> But accountability no, so, I mean, and responsibility yeah. is so important. We do these frames, frameworks, and a strategic plan that didn't sit on somebody's shelf because they didn't put no money to it. They didn't tell you you were responsible for it. You're, we're going to check back with you to make sure you did it. If you didn't do it, what's the accountability there? I'm on fire. I'm a... I'm a <laughs> no, Dr. Sapp, by all means, uh, thank you for your insight. Uh, I mean... You want to go ahead and, and answer the question? I mean, you started, so you can go ahead and provide some more insight. This is very good information. Some of the, the challenges are people are not being held accountable, right? And responsible for these strategic plans and frameworks. The benefit is we can write them. We can hire a consultant to get it done. But are we looking at it? Are we carrying it through? Are we putting money behind it? Are we saying you're responsible, tag, you're it? And it's not just the black and brown people that's being tagged in, right? That everyone is responsible for diversity and inclusion because we can all have enough of this, right? So that's my response with all, everything else I said. I'm, I'm gonna just add into here. I know it, it's difficult because we all try to share share the mic, um, <laughs> so to speak, but you know, Dr. Sapp is also my sorority sister. So we can't necessarily let that slide throughout this entire program. Um, but in addition to that, I, I do have to lean into one of the things that she did say, but I'm gonna hold it and, and let other people say it, say their piece. And then I'm gonna come back in with, with a, a, a key element that she hit on. Okay, no problem. Uh, Dr. Boyd. I think we can make a business case for diversity at our universities because the more we can introduce our students to a divergent mindset, it increases level of diversity, it increases the amount of critical thinking skills, but also we need diversity in faculty and staff because our students need mentors. And many of us, I like to call us black academics, Many of the black academics need to be there so that the young people can see the direction that they need to go in. They need to understand that this is somewhere that, uh, that I can go, something that I can do. But one of the challenges is that a lot of people who are in favor of diversity, they don't know what it means, they don't know what it looks like, and they'll say, I don't say anything because I don't want to say the wrong thing, so then they stay silent. So we have to help them and walk them along and help them understand what's going on. But also we have to understand uh, those of us that deal with uh, major gift donors, many of our major gift donors tend to be pretty conservative and may not be yet on board with levels of diversity. And then those that have 
criminal justice programs or business schools or fire science schools tend to have more conservative students that may not be bought into the role of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So then we leave off that last part, the belonging. We have to build a level of belonging on campus, and that in and of itself is hard. No, thank you for your thoughts, Dr. Boyd. Uh, Dr. Horton. Yes, I was just looking at my notes. Of course, I echoed, I, we all know the challenges. And I am usually the Debbie Downer, but I'm going to do better today. <laughs> because my institution, for what it's worth, has actually been doing a really good job. Um, so I think one of the um, one of the benefits of promoting DEI is the re reimagining how we view institutions of higher education, particularly those public institutions. They don't belong to me, they belong to the people. And as such, they should reflect what the people look like. And I think by promoting equity and inclusion, you bring more people into the fold, you bring more people to the table, and then there's a, a recalibrating our commitment to these institutions because they aren't ours. They don't belong to the faculty, they don't belong to the chancellors, they don't belong to the Republicans or the Democrats, they belong to the people who fund them. And so I think it's very empowering um, to promote it so that people understand they own it just like we own the government and these institutions should reflect the values of everyone in our community. The challenges are what they are. I could go on and on and on, but we all know that's why we're here having this conversation. My colleagues have articulated it very well. So I will I will end on the positive note because I rarely do. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Horton. Uh, Dr. Mitchell. So um, I come from a student affairs background, so I tend to lean positive. Um, but that's, that's what they paid me to do when I got into the field early and it distracts people. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the, the benefit for me. This is wondrous, joyful work. You know, I love this work. You know, it's the work I was built for. It's the work I was trained for when I was when I was very young. I used to do the Black Fear Counseling Center when I was young, wild, and Greek. And I did a good job then. I'm not young, wild, young or wild anymore, but I'm still um, still a little Greek. You know, um, but it's it's work that feeds my soul. You know, uh, I had a small task yesterday where I just got the campus back on our campus. We're gonna have two. We balling because we have no campus. You know. Now, I'm an alpha, but still, I want Kappas and Sigmas, Iotas, the AKAs, Deltas, we on a row. And if I missed anybody, I want you to. You know, I want everybody. You know, I want the students to have the experiences that I remember from my youth. And so it's joyous work for me. Um, and, I'm, and I'm deeply immersed in the literature, deeply immersed in the theory, but that's what drives me is making sure that they have that experience. And we all know that we change lives. And we don't have to question it. We change lives and we also shift culture. So that's the benefit of doing this work. That's why I'm still in it. I've been in it for 30 years. I've drifted off into other fields, but I've come back to this work. My biggest challenge is it's hard work and I'm tired. You know, I, I'm tired and I'm tired every day. You know, I have weeks where I can't sleep because of the decisions we have made or because of the, the callous things that people say around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm tired. I spend, I try not to be mad all the time, but I have, I had a mad day today. I was talking to be with y'all. I needed this. You know, I had a really mad day today because people, People on both sides of the fence, those people of, of, of color and stakeholders, not from marginalized communities, sometimes be quiet, be quiet. Let's move forward. Let's get some work done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on the other end of the fence, those people who don't get it, I sometimes I'm a little bit more patient with them. They don't get it. So I'm not worried about them. You know, it's those of us who are stakeholders that are really important. I think that one thing that's a challenge for those of us, those stakeholders that we have, those people are trying to inspire, they get distracted by shenanigans that people put in our way. And that's all it is, it's shenanigans. People have been putting blocks and putting and interfering with the work for years. And we have been successful through all that, you know? So that's all they are. So we had a four year shenanigan. I didn't know we were gonna make it, but we made it, you know? So we're gonna, cont we're gonna continue to do, do well with this work. So for me, the biggest challenge isn't, isn't the way institutions are. The biggest challenge sometimes is, is us keeping our motivation and keeping our eyes and be, keeping our focus. We're gonna get this done. And I don't care what you say. You said no today. Well, then tomorrow you're gonna have to talk to me again, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. We're gonna continue to make progress. But that's that's me. I, and I um, I, I I like all of you. I have months sometimes where I'm like, why why be positive? But I know that people are watching. And for those young people and those faculty and staff who are watching, sometimes I have to be that positive person in the room. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, everyone, um, for your thoughts with regard to this. This question, this is why I chose this topic, because I, I needed it to be discussed so people can really understand what the end goal is to continue making progress. 
Um, that's what I've gathered from each one of you all's um, statements. Um, Dr. Campbell, did you want to add your statement or are you going to? I'll, I'll hold it. I feel like it's going to come, come back later. Okay. I'm going to hold it for now. <laughs> okay. No problem. Oh, well, so let's move on to the next question. Um, what role do you see academic leaders play in the implementation of effective diversity and inclusion practices? Dr. Boyd. Well, we have a leadership role, first of all. We have to show the people who don't know what to do what they're supposed to be doing. We have to show them big picture. We have to have a vision. We have to have a mission. We have to have a one, three, and five-year plan. And then once we get to it, we've got to redo it all over again. Because the line of demarcation with race and ethnicity changes all the time. Because the work we were doing prior to May 25th, prior to the George Floyd murder, was very different than the work that we're doing now and with the protests and everything else. So the leaders have to lead. We have to have vision. The old folks will have vision and the young people will have dreams. Thank you. Dr. Horton, what are your thoughts? So I think when I think about uh, the role of academics, I think specifically about policy and you can't really implement significant changes in policies unless you have academic folks on board, unless you have people in academic roles, because for those of you who may not, who, who are out there, who may not be familiar with the organizational structure of institutions of higher education, the academic senate runs the show. And so you can't do this work without having academic folks um, in place, people who are versed in the literature, people who are versed in the experiences of the students. So you have your student affairs uh, professionals, and then people who are who just are versed in their own personal experiences and bring that um, uh, forefront to the forefront of the conversation. Uh, I just don't think you can push this forward without that. Um, and so I think the role is vital, it is necessary, and it is, as we would say in STEM, it is both necessary and sufficient for anything to really get done. No, well, thank you, Dr. Horton. Dr. Sapp. You know, I, I I love this question because and I and I echo my colleagues, right? When we talk about academic affairs drives the 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 uh, ship, the boat, the the scooter, the motorcycle, the 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 little skateboard, you know, when we talk about bridging that gap and being able to do both, right? I am in both, right? I have my foot in both. You know, I do. I was in residence life. I was in leadership. I was in Greek affairs, and now I'm in academic affairs and doing all the academic in the curriculum, and serving on the faculty council and serving on the senate and understanding, serving on a promotion and tenure. If we, our roles as leaders is to get our foot in those doors to be able to have a seat at the table, right? If we're not at the table, we're on the menu, right? We've, we've heard that analogy spoken a lot, right? And bridging that gap. And one of the things that I say as leaders, we have to get folks comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. But after May, I say the world is watching. If you can't find your voice and do what you have to do at this point, you're going to miss your opportunity. I love it. The old people have the vision, the young folks have the dreams. And I tell you, our millenniums tore it up. They tore the place down. If you have what, what um, Mary Frances uh, Winters talks about, sublime ignorance. Well, guess what? You're woke now. You're woke now. They tore this place up and now they are paying attention. And if we don't do what we need to do on our campuses at this point, it's happening generation after generation, right? So this is the time the world is watching. Stake your claim, right? Don't hold back, have courage. We are the leaders on this campus. They're coming to us and asking us, tell them, because I'm not holding nothing back. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable and I'm telling them everything. I'm singing like a canary. We need to do this and we need to do it now. It's been too long. No, thank you, Dr. Sam. Um, Dr. Mitchell. I knew you were gonna make me go after her. Okay. 
<laughs> Dr. Sapp, um, uh, we, we people. I don't know. I don't know where we connected before, but in some other life, we people. Um, so, so um, I think that um, my approach to this work is through the, through campus leadership. So when I get when I come to a campus, the first people I meet for the first two weeks, all I'm trying to meet are the deans, chairs, and the and the president's cabinet. And amongst the president's cabinet, one of the most important people for me is the provost, because for me. It's not, I don't want to know whether or not the provost is committed. I want to get a sense for what I think that provost is going to do. You know, I might learn about commitment later on, but I want to know right early on what the provost is going to do because you can't make changes in curriculum. You can't make changes in faculty hiring. You can't make, you can't make substantive change without the provost being on board. And the academic end of the house is going to follow in my experience because everybody's experience is different. And in my experience, the academic end of the college is going to follow, follow the provost. The other people on the cabinet are going to follow the provost and the president is going to pay attention to the provost you know so for me i like to work with the leadership um i attend faculty senate meetings i don't care what my role is there sometimes i just attend i'm just in the just in the gallery because i want to know what they're talking about i don't want to know what's important to them i want to know how to reach That's them right. my newest thing that i'm trying to do in, in in higher ed i really believe that for us to make, to make progress i love a diversity plan but I've been to some campuses where they have each college also making diversity plans and then each department making diversity plans. And that's and that's the that's the trend for the future. You know, it makes sense to me. The smallest department in student affairs, the physical plan needs to have a diversity plan. Everybody needs to have a diversity plan and they need to follow it. And then they need people like us on the campuses to help it, to help people by giving them the resources and support. But that but that direction needs to come from the president and the provost and the rest of the cabinet. So all of all of it connects, but to me. Like I said, you got to get the provost because you can't. If you can't affect change in the classroom, you're not going to be successful in any of the other. You know? So it has it has to come from that from that area. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Dr. Thank Campbell. I, I'm in total agreement, um, uh, Dr. Mitchell, that you you do look to the the leadership structure, um, in particular the provost and the president, um, the cabinet. Um, in my former role, I sat in a central administration seat. I still do, um, being a part of the Office of Human Resources. But my role was mostly um, to be responsible for diversity programming for the entire institution. And what I observed mostly is that a lot of it is driven by what those conversations, whatever those conversations are uh, that the cabinet is having, specifically what the provost is thinking, as you alluded to, as well as some other key players. Um, but one of the pieces that I, I want to touch on is what it does to us, right? So part of this, this work really does pull a lot on us, our faces, um, with, with regardless of where we sit in the matrix of things in higher ed, um, oftentimes we become, as Dr. Sapp alluded to earlier, all of the weight is on our shoulders. Um, because we have the visual representation of being that person that's going to be the reminder um, for any DEI initiative that's actually going on. And so for me, what I always come back to is well what what about us how are we actually making sure that we're staying connected to uh what these dei efforts are are we also are we selling ourselves short and i'm saying we the collective we black people we when it comes to are we going to be a part of the the actual movement forward or are we just trying to pacify or appease whatever the the, the language or the rhetoric that's put out there we actually have to be committed to that work and what does that mean for us what's at stake when we decide to actually commit ourselves to DEI efforts, right? So that is always a big piece for me. And I've seen too many of our leaders who sit in very key positions and they forget. You can actually experience them forgetting, honey, you still black, honey, you still brown. You know, so you cannot forget that you're not necessarily the exception to whatever is going on, right? You are still a part of mainstream society. There's still all these societal norms that are coming at us and you have to realize that there's a lot of complexity associated with you serving in that particular position and how you navigate it it means a lot especially when you have other black and brown people looking at you to make sure are they still down can i still trust them in the process of actually moving um de and i forward so wonderful can i just Thank try you. to say real quickly that to dr campbell's point I think that's also why it's important that people who do this work also maintain community connections 
make sure that you're engaging the community, go volunteer, like get your hands dirty volunteer because otherwise it's very easy to live in this ivory tower. You know, our, our salaries didn't stop when COVID hit. We're living a life that many of us couldn't have dreamed of growing up, myself specifically. <laughs> and as such, it's really important that you actually get out in the community or at least stay very distinctly connected to people who do the groundwork so that you always remember that there's a population outside of the people who are privileged enough to be in your institutions. So. No, thank you. I really appreciate this dialogue and I hope our audience members seem to be agreeing with a lot of what you all are saying and providing some comments here um, on our live stream. But this just goes to show that this topic is, is very important and a lot of people may be scared to talk about it and this is why we have these dialogues. So I really appreciate everyone um, here this evening. So, and you know, uh, I also wanted to add, and I know it's always me, like she always got to add something, <laughs> but I'm black and that's what we do. This is church at this point, but really mental health too, and making sure that we take care of our mental health and fill our cup and how we step away to make sure that we're okay to be able to come back and go right back in it, you know. Brother Dr. Mitchell said today was not a good day for him. Well, brother, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it. And I'm hoping that this is filling your cup to a point where you know that we are in this together. You have my contact information. If you want to contact me, just talk and figure out some strategies. We can do that. But we also have to remember that too, right? Dr. Hoyt, your, your information about just being here. We we didn't lose our paychecks. We're still working. And so many people have. I'm a first generation three times over, undergrad, grad, and my doctorate. You know what I mean? And so really understanding that, like Dr. Campbell said, when we're sitting at these tables and we're high up in our towers, not to forget the others, right? But also taking care of ourselves, our mental health and well-being. How do we turn it off? so that we can get it back up again, so that we can do what we need to do and do the work for these students. And really understanding those five Ps. You asked me to go back to them, I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna do it right now, get your paper ready, people who listening, whatever you do. Dr. Sapp, five Ps. I'm talking about policy. I'm talking about procedures. I'm talking about protocols. I'm talking about practices. And I'm talking about process. And so when we get into those and really dig in deep, it takes stuff from us to be able to navigate that and being able to sit in these rooms and hear how they're moving and how they're navigating spaces and learning how to do the same thing. Learning how to do, I had to learn how to disagree and still feel like I wasn't gonna take you to the green. You hear me? I'm from New York City, the Bronx. You what? You said what in the meeting? Oh, I'm going to meet you outside and how to not do that and be able to turn that off to be able to get the resource and the services you need to get for our students and for junior faculty. Right. And understanding how to move and then use that as a tool to teach others, to bring others to campus. Like Dr. Boyd was saying, bringing people to campus and having those wraparound services. But you got to fill your cup because you can't pour from an empty cup. So even understanding that. No, thank you. And I hope the audience members feeling this energy this wait, evening. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. She said she's gonna take somebody out. That's good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> My cup is very full. Thank you so much. Keep it up. Thank you. No, this is a this is a great conversation. And then yeah, realizing that street smarts that you come with, they can't, they don't know what to do with me. I, I play their game. I listen to what they're saying. I'll be like, oh, but what, what, wait, when we did it on here. So even having that street smarts and being able to pay attention and being able to use that to be able to change policy. I'm on, I'm on a search committee for a, a faculty person and I'm changing the whole job description because it's just not right, right? We're looking for a social justice person and this person is doing everything. And I'm like, uh-uh, not under my watch. And I have one of my colleagues was like, is it typical for search committees to change the job description? This one is going to be changed because we're not doing what we used to do. This ain't your old institution. We're not doing the status quo. 
We can't hire this social justice faculty person and they're doing everything. Wait a minute. We got to take some of this stuff out because we are setting this person up. And by the time they get here, they're not going to stay because it's too much that we're asking them to do. What are other faculty doing? And so they don't ask me to be on the committee. Oh, they like, we got to get her off of this committee. But we changed that job description. I tell you that much because we cannot have people coming in doing all of this because nobody else is doing it. They'll never get promoted. No, thank you. Again, I hope the audience members is feeling the energy this evening for this wonderful topic. Um, they are definitely agreeing, as you can see, some we have a lot of comments coming in. And reaching out to my audience members, please like, share, subscribe with your all your friends and family members. This is a wonderful topic to start off Black History Month and really dig deep into diversity and inclusion. So I want to uh, move around uh, to my, another question that I have here for you all. Do you think that the implementation of diversity and inclusion practices vary by institutional setting? For example, HBCU versus PWI. Dr. Mitchell. Well, I, I think that um, I don't have the experience of the HBCU. I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I started in the work a long time ago. And the idea that we were doing diversity, equity, inclusion work at the HBCU is refreshing to me and exciting. You know, I think that there's so much potential on those campuses. I'm uh, so people know. And if you want to bring me to your campus, I'll come because I'll change jobs every couple of years. You know, so I'm really excited about that work. I think that um, my experience has been in different kind of PWIs. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. I've worked in liberal arts colleges, you know, um, you know uh, what people consider classic, you know, small rural liberal arts colleges that cost a lot of money. And I've worked at uh, state colleges where um, tuition is like $6,000. And I can tell you there's a huge difference between the work there. And what I've seen so far is at a liberal arts college, sometimes, sometimes you can get things done quicker. You know, this, it's a smaller college, there's money there. You can get things done quicker, but sometimes this change doesn't last because um, people, administrators especially move through liberal arts colleges. You know, at, at the larger PWI, sometimes the traditions and the resistance to DI efforts are so ingrained and people have worked there for 30 years. Um, you know, they, you know, administrators have worked there for 30 years. The idea is even though, even though they're right, they're not fresh and they're not they're not on point. You know, one of the things I've, I've enjoyed so much about these past 10 years of diversity work is that I, I have peers who are chief diversity officers who are 25, 26, 27, fresh out of their October programs. I, I love the I love being in rooms with them. I love getting the ideas that they have, having having that fresh spirit around things. Some of them tell me they say, you know, you know, um, it's kind of creepy that you're hanging out with us because you're so old. I'm like, yeah, but it's gonna just gonna have to be creepy because I need to learn from you. You know, I need to learn from you. And I said, and if you and I said, if you're wise, you'll learn from me too because I have some old skills I can bring to the table. But I think that I think that um, the major difference between the campuses is that we really need to pay attention and tailor our work to that campus rather than taking like a real generic approach. I, I had a friend who went to work at an HBCU, and she comes. She's she's wonderful. She has a wonderful skill set. But she went to the HBCU trying to do the work she was doing at a PWI. It's different work. It's different people. And the way they appreciate the work and view the work is very different. So just being really cognizant of your environment and tailoring to the campus where you are, is, I think is the most important thing you have to do um, to, to reflect those differences. No, oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Horton. Yes, so this is actually one of my favorite questions. Um, I used to be faculty at an HBCU for five years. I'm also a graduate of an HBCU, um, but I went to uh, a PWI, a giant research institution for graduate school, well, for my PhD. And now the last two places I've worked in ginormous um, PWIs are one research one institutions. I think that what happens at predominantly undergraduate institutions that serve minority populations, so Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, HBCUs, they've pretty much got DEI unlocked because there's no choice, right? There's no choice. People of color, oppressed people, people from marginalized communities don't get the option to not know how to do DEI work properly. We don't get to bring white students into our midst and treat them the way that we are treated when we're brought into their midst. So they're doing it right. What we need to do as PWIs, for those of you who may not know, predominantly white institutions, or R1, right, research intensive institutions that have all the money and all the resources, as we need to stop being incestuous 
and thinking that we in our little bubbles actually have the answers. And we need to engage the faculty who are at the minority serving institutions and elevate them for their expertise because they already know how to do it. The reason I got the job that I got is because I was faculty at the HBCU and my former boss was like, I bet she already knows how to do this. And she was right. I have a PhD in cell biology. I have no degree in diversity, anything in sociology and history, but my lived experience is enough. The sociologists out there, what they do is they put data to my lived experience. So I'm able to actually do this work without having to have a degree specializing in this field. So what we really need to do is elevate the expertise of these people because they already are doing it. They're doing it well. They're creating physicians and engineers and teachers and nurses and, and, and everybody you can think of. We don't need a bunch of more research. We need to go to the local community college, which is far more diverse than any institution of how, any of the bigger institutions, the research institutions. Go to your tribal colleges, go to your HBCUs, go to your Hispanic serving institutions. Gather up those people who have PhDs just like you do and tell them, we need you, we need your help. Can you train us? Can you tell us what you do? And we should be learning from them. And that's just, mm -hmm. that's just it is what it is in a nutshell. I'm very passionate about that as a person who used to be faculty at an HBCU. And that's, that's all I have to say about that. That is excellent. I'm sorry. I'm, Thank I'm, I'm, you, I'm, Dr. I'm, I'm you. Dr. Campbell. I, I'm gonna just say Ashe. I, I just there's there's no other words to really uh, add to that response because you know sister girl got it you know so I'm good. I, I that was part of my response and I'm gonna just say I'm just I've only been at a PWI. And so that's been my lens, my experience. I've had the exposure to Western schools where their philosophy is a little bit different, but for the most part, yeah, you got to engage the people who've been doing this work since day one. <laughs> so I, I say, I, that's all I got right there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sam. I say times two, next question, baby. <laughs> Dr. Boyd. You know, it, it, there's definitely a dichotomy there, having been degreed at, uh, at R1, but having been tenured in administration at two HBCUs, it's very, very different because the perspective is different. You know, when you're at a PWI, you know, you, you tend to experience what I call the black tax. And there's not that many of us, so we have to answer the questions. And we're always on the Black History Month committee or the MLK committee. And anything to do with uh, students of color, then you have to be the one to do it. It's not like that at HBCUs because there are more people doing more work. There, there's a time at HBCU to exhale. And admittedly, you know, at least the two um, state HBCUs that I've been to, the resources weren't as as good at the um, PWIs, but the family was a little different. And the way we handled the students, the way we dealt with the students, we meant, we spent more quality time, I thought, with students at HBCUs. And then for me, at least, a lot of the young brothers that um, needed mentoring or didn't have fathers ended up being part of my circle. And you get to spend more time with these young brothers outside of the classroom, outside of school, you know, um, talking to them a lot and mentoring them through life. It's just part of the role that society assigns you if you're called to an HBCU. And I got to say, being at an HBCU is absolutely a calling and it's fulfilling. And for those that haven't done it, give it a try. It's work. It's work. Like Dr. Mitchell said, you get tired. It's work. But it's fulfilling work. Thank you. See, this is this is a great conversation. I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying myself, and I think like again, the audience is is definitely chiming in and loving all this insight you all are providing. So the next question that I have is, how does the socio political environment influence the success of diversity and inclusion strategies in higher education? Dr. Mitchell. So um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania, and in Pennsylvania, I'm part of the Pashi system. And before the election, and I'm going to speak directly to the election, so that way I can free everybody else to be able to speak to that too. You know, um, before the election, we we got a we got a series of directives about curtailing our diversity work. You know, 
And the young professionals around me were very disturbed by that. And, and I wasn't as disturbed. And I didn't know why until, until after the election. Because immediately after the election, we got a series of memos um, reversing all those things. But the, but the, the damage it, it did was now people are feeling like they, there can be ways to curtail our work. You know, and so I, I, I have, I'm having discussions with colleagues who would never have talked to me about, well, what kind of restraints should we put on your work? What kind of assessment should we do for your work? How are you going to prove that your work is valuable? And we've always had to respond to, you know, uh, showing value in our work. But, but people now are, are acting like we have to justify our work in new ways. And so th those last four years were very damaging to our work. And so the social economic uh, environment has hurt us a lot. And then for, for us with boots on the ground, you know, and, and diversity officers don't have the luxury of not dealing with all the real problems that our students and our faculty and staff deal with. So, you know, I can I can try to walk by a student who I know is food insecure, but I can't do that. I don't I, don't, I can't do that. I have to stop, stop and take a minute. You know, I, I can't I can't ignore a young mother who doesn't who doesn't have a way to get to campus. You know, I can't ignore a faculty member who's sitting in her office crying because she's been demeaned in a in a meeting, or a young man who's been sitting in the office crying. You know, so our work our work is so impactful and we have we have to be so strong through those times i like that dr sap told us to do self-care but i'm the worst i'm the worst I, i'm falling apart as, as we speak you know and not emotionally i'm physically falling apart because the work is taxing on us you know so dealing with the social economic environment around us it makes it makes the work something that we take home with us it makes the work something that we're always shouldering it makes us speak up in spaces I'm like Dr. Sapp, sometimes I just have to say it and just take the repercussions from it. You know, it makes us it makes us put ourselves out there all the time. So personally, it impacts us in that it, it really, I think, sometimes deters from the large visioning that we get to do. But then also on a on a micro scale, you know, and on an everyday scale, it impacts us because um we have to keep so focused. And we have to, I, you know, my mother told me when I was young, we have to do 150%. I think diversity officers have to do 230%. You know, I think we have to go, we have to go above and beyond when we're doing this work. You know, and so I don't want to just focus on our experiences, but I think sometimes our our critics sometimes are, are our own folks. And I don't think they really think about how much we have on our shoulders. I tell people, I say, look at my shoulders. And they say, what? I, I do this. I say, I'm carrying the whole institution, everything about this predominantly white institution. I'm carrying, trying to carry forward. I said, and it's really, really hard. And I don't think people understand how much, how much the external factors impact the internal work that we're trying to do on our campus. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Dr. Horton. So this one is a little bit, I don't have as distinct a sound bite for this one. <laughs> this is not my favorite question. Um, but I will say that, uh, of course, it has an impact um, because the best way to, I think, reduce the amount of resources that we put towards this is to politicize it, which means that our ability to do our work swings depending on the political uh, landscape. Um, but I think there's a benefit to that in some ways. Um, it teaches you to weather those storms and it teaches you to know what to expect. And given how, how far the pendulum swung the last four years, I think it woke up a lot of people, which is evidenced by the voting, the, the sheer amount of voting. And I think, um, the more civic engagement we have, the better, because to be perfectly honest, when you look at a ballot, uh, the further down the ballot you go, the closer to your actual house you get. And I think people now, more people now have an understanding of the impact of local voting. Um, and so knowing that there's a huge impact is beneficial when you think about what that impact has been when we didn't know, right? And so now that we know, people who probably weren't typically going to engage or care will now spread the gospel, so to speak. And hopefully over time that will have reverberate back and have a positive impact. Um, again, I'm not normally, I'm not a half glass full kind of person. <laughs> so I promise you this isn't normally how I operate, but I can't help but be heartened by the number of people who were uh, civically engaged. And so there it is, it, it does swing. I do think, um, like I said, having those swings teaches us how to weather storms but the increase in civic engagement i think is going to be beneficial because so much of what we do is is so um sort of inextricably linked to the socio-political climate no oh, thank you thank you for your insight with regard to that question dr campbell 
Um, they're definitely, well, one of the, the biggest things that I, I keep coming back to is this, the word success, um, recognizing that, again, as I articulated earlier in our um, discussion, that how we understand what success looks like is definitely different for um, how mainstream America sees what success looks like. And so for us, um, the last four years definitely put a damper on things, right? It put a it put us in a very awkward and interesting headspace. But I'll just say from what I observed, what, what my institution did, um, the, the, the energy was we're gonna keep going. We're gonna keep moving. We're gonna keep pushing. Um, we're not going to allow all of the outside noise to really dampen the work that we are trying to do. And, you know, I, I recognize, I actually observed in my leaders that this whole push-pull method, you know, that was happening um, and that's definitely during the last uh, six months, you know, in 2020 of feeling like, you know, this issue coming up and this issue coming up and that issue. And you're trying to keep the, 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 the train moving, but every time you take one step forward, you feel like you're going like 10 steps back. But what I admired about uh, the leadership was that there was still a willingness to, to keep pushing forward in the midst of things just kind of being just all over the place. So the social political political environment will always impact the success of DEI work um, at the institution. Um, but I think for us, and I think even what my colleagues have also shared too, is how much do we really want to focus on that? Do we want to just keep all of our energy there or are we going to keep our mind on the actual work itself and, and try to keep moving, making some headway um, forward? No, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Uh, Dr. Sapp. I love this question. When we look at over the past four years, yes, I believe that it has greatly impacted institutions. Now, whether we wanted to pay attention or not, some people went into their shells, some institutions came out screaming because they didn't want to be they don't, it exposed the ugly underbelly of America that all people of color knew was there. But some of our colleagues who are allies, they, they had a comfortable space of just staying silent. Well, that, what happened in the four years exposing the ugly underbelly of what we already knew it allowed some people to amplify their voices. And they was like, I'm not with that one. And they begin to stand up and start speaking and start doing stuff. I mean, at my institution, my colleagues came out in droves. Now, at first they didn't. And I wrote a dear uh, colleague's letter. Yes, I did. I wrote a dear colleague's letter. Because since I've been at my institution, I did stuff for LGBT right everybody was on board i did stuff for first generation everyone is on board when it come time for race i knew they wasn't ready when i got there because it was only three black faculty on campus right a hispanic uh two so i knew they weren't ready so i did other stuff and then you mean to tell me when it came time for my time i've been there for three years doing this work and they've been in it with me i got 29 people on the first generation committee i got 14 doing lgbt stuff we just doing it and when it came time for this y'all know where to be found oh yes i called them out i wrote a dear colleague letter. the president called me i i i just want to talk to you okay what you want to talk about we did a zoom what you want to talk about and so he's asked me, what are your recommendations for what us to do? I had 17. I'm glad you asked. I said, I wrote a, I wrote a letter. He said, I know uh, they showed it to me. I said, good. So you know how disappointed I am. He was like, uh, yeah, you know how disappointed I am. So when we talk about voices being amplified and some of my colleagues is like, okay, I can't sit on the, the sidelines anymore. I'm going to have to speak up. I'm going to have to come out and say stuff. My colleagues, they came out and drove saying stuff. I said, great, because I need the dominant culture, Eurocentric culture. To Y'all going to have to do the work. I'm tired. Y'all do it. I'm going to need y'all to do this. I can tell you where to go. I got 17 recommendations and he he adopted them, and he was doing it. Mandatory, mandatory for everyone. Boy, some folks were mad. 
but I bet you they were there. They were there. And so really understanding that this four years have exposed the un underbelly that we already knew was there. We knew it. We were living it. But we had sublime ignorance like Mary Frances Winter talks about. Sublime ignorance like everything is okay. Everything is roses. We don't even know stuff is happening. But I guess they know now. And it amplified some voices that would have been sleeping for decades. So that's that's what I feel. Yes, the social political environment absolutely it influenced the diversity strategies in higher education. And if we're not paying attention, we're not going to make those recommendations that we need to make. This is the time to make those recommendations. It's been a long time to make them. And sometimes we have to repeat ourselves because we've already made them. Well, make them again, people. Make them again. They're listening now. It has exposed the underbelly that we already knew was here. Now they know it's here. Now they, how, do, how can I help? They asking for books for their children. I'm giving them everything. Teach your kids because then they're gonna move into these positions too and they need to be educated because they're not doing it in K to 12. So get all the literature, talk to them about it, have a conversation. Let's start teaching people about the history. Slavery is white history too. So it exposed the underbelly. People are waking up. They're doing stuff. They're shifting stuff. They're trying to be allies to folks of color because they don't want to be on that side. Like, I don't want I don't want nothing to do with that. That's not who I am. Well, then you're going to have to take some action. I'm going to put what you say. I want to see it in your action, your attitude and your behavior. And I've been holding people accountable and they have not disappointed me yet. There's still microaggressions I'm dealing with. There's still that stuff. It's always going to be that stuff. And I can deal with that. But now that I know who my, now I know who they are, they've come out of the cracks and they're like, we standing with you. Okay, well, this is your task and this is your task and that's your task. And they're like, okay, I, I'm finished with it. What else I do? That's what I'm yeah. looking for. I'm looking for those people. So Thank yes, you, it, it has an influence. Thank you. Dr. Boyd. You know, socially and politically, it would be nice to think that our universities are in a vacuum, but what happens in the rest of the world ends up on our campuses. We've got uh, students from all over the country and in different countries. So every time there's something political that happened and all politics is local, but all of these local politics come together. And let's, let's acknowledge our students are hurting. There's a lot of black and brown students that are hurting because of what's going on financially in this country. And then with the uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Maude Aubrey, I can go on and on and on. They're dealing with that. And then they have to deal with the protests because their voices need to be heard and protests then move into riots and stuff. And all of that is wrapped in a pandemic and people are not allowed to be where they want to be on campus. And there's a lot of uh, you know distance learning through all of that, we still expect them to do well academically at the time in their lives when they're just trying to figure out who they are. Many of them are away from home for the first time. They don't know yet how to do a lot of the stuff they need to do. So we're putting a lot on them and our people in particular, because of their blackness and the way society in America deals with them, they're hurting. So we need to have community conversations. We need to bring these students together. We need to listen to them. And we need to either literally or figuratively wrap our arms around them and keep them safe to shelter them through this storm. Because the political climate that we went through the last four years, no one should have gone through uh, that. And again, remember a lot of universities are talking about the business case of higher ed, trying to uh, stay in business or trying to make a profit but we can't afford to do that on the backs of uh, black and brown kids. We need to protect our young folks because what's happening in the world, what's happening in our nation and what's happening in a lot of our local jurisdictions, it's affecting our students and it's affecting sometimes the ability for them to do well academically. We need to shield them and we need to protect them. So I, I, I don't want to, so here's the, the one space where I'm always a wet blanket. I, I, I don't know if we're gonna ever fix this. So that's why I think our work is so important. I think we just got, I think we had to hunker down and do this work because I don't know that we'll ever fix this. 
I'm a, um, I talk about my age because I'm, my, my birthday is coming up and I'm looking forward to my birthday. But, but the reality is this is the worst time of my life. Uh, it is one of the worst times of my life. And I've had death in the family. I've had personal illness. I'm talking about as a society where I didn't, I haven't been out the house since March, really. I've been out a couple of times, but I haven't really been out the house, you know, where I felt free and comfortable to go out the house. Even we, we bought a home today and I was really happy about that. I, I need to get out of that real estate office. I, I was walking, I was I, I'm in a state where people were walking around without masks and, and trying to offer me coffee. I was like, you need to get away from me so I can get back to my house. You know, it's a horrible time. And I, and I think about, it, I have a 20 year old daughter in school in New Orleans. I think every day about about the things she's risking. So Dr. Boyd, you, you re reconnected me to those concerns I have about the young people is important. Cause I, you know, I talk about my concerns, but I'm not anywhere near as concerned as I am for a young person. I worry about young professionals who are in their thirties and forties and they just kind of begin in their career. What do they have to look forward to in higher education? You know, we've we've wrecked we've wrecked this system for them. So those of us who have been in the work for a long time, those of us who are older, we got to make sure that we maintain so we can have something to leave to them. Because I'm really concerned about what we've what we've left to these people behind us and how they're going to make it. I'm really I'm really concerned about that. So thank you for getting me off of my my bad day and helping me remember there's a whole society to certain today. I, I just want to add, you know, for, for the young people, because I, I will acknowledge that I'm a millennial in this space. Um, you know, one of the challenges that I find that we have to do is we have to lean into our elders. We have to lean into people who have done it before and, and be able to foster conversation with them where there is a mutual uh, relationship and exchange so that we can have some real productivity and growth, right? We've, I've experienced being the person who's the youngest one in the room, but, I've, but being acknowledged as someone who doesn't know what to do, right? Who doesn't have a clue of how this work is supposed to actually happen. And I've experienced it from people who look like me and of course from mainstream culture as well. But one of the things that I keep holding on to is that I, I gotta find my people. I gotta find my community. I gotta find the elders who can pour into me and give me some insight about what's happening. So we are there, we are holding on, we, we trying to make our way in this space of higher education and trying to navigate, well, what is it gonna look like in the next five, 10, 15 years? And I even just, me personally, I've observed that we as a people have a hard time actually dreaming, actually being willing to act, to uh, reimagine what the future could look like. And so for us, I believe our role as millennials, as centennials, is to help keep you all alive and well and thriving and all that kind of stuff, give you that energy so that you can keep pouring into us as well. So it's this this wraparound um, thing that's happening in higher ed. And we know that the numbers of us is, is low, right? There's not a lot of us that it even exists, especially when we talk about predominantly white institutions. Um, and so it's even harder for us to try to find our people. But when we find them, we try to hold on as tight as we possibly can so that we know that, you know, this this my people, this my family, and I'm not gonna let go. Cause I, I believe in the collectiveness of our of us being able to move forward and not, you know, and not staying where we have been um in the past. So I just wanted to add that to what you were sharing. Thank you. Thank you all for just a elaborate and diverse conversation and for hitting all the, the great points I need. Mean, we have a plethora of comments coming in right now, and it's, it's just thoroughly amazing. So I wanna go ahead and close out the show really quickly with a um, quick response, rapid fire question. How has your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network helped to enhance you personally and or professionally? Let me start with that. Um, this is my third year in the Black Doctoral Network. It's a place that I can be me, I can kind of, exhale. I can be around other Black academics and we can talk about the issues that affect us because I often talk about the masking of Black America, particularly in higher ed, where we have this facade that we walk around with. When I'm in the Black Doctoral Network, it's a place where I can, as a vice president, I can walk in and say, let me explain to you some of the, uh, the job openings. Let me explain to you some of the things that are going to get you in there. Because ultimately, higher ed, you know, it, it's like academic hazing. You know, going through higher ed, I thought was worse than when I played Sigma. So if I can get uh, young people 
to understand where we're going and remove some of the barriers and remove some of the hurdles that they have to go through. Because I'm on the other side of that, I can explain to them what the other side is. So part of it is I get to be me and I get to be myself. The other part of it is that I can help people that are coming up where I used to be. So I guess I'll chime in next. Um, so first of all, <laughs> the beauty of the Black Doctoral Network is that you know we're all trying to engage with people who are listening and watching. And I can say without fail that a Greek Black person is going to find a way to throw their Greek in there. So you know who's the only non-Greek on the call? I just wanted to bring that up. But you can only say that kind of stuff when you're part of the Black Doctoral Network. I see y'all. Um, <laughs> For me, I've only been doing um, work in, so I used to work on the undergraduate side, but now I'm on the, the graduate side. And so, and because of the way that my work is positioned, um, I do have to think about how we uh, diversify faculty in addition to just graduate student population. And so the way that the Black Doctoral Network has been beneficial to me is because it is a repository of really amazing people, right? And it's all nicely packaged and well put together so that I can say, hey, you're looking to hire. He we have a membership, an institutional membership. Here is the pool. You can't say the numbers don't exist. Um, so it provides a way. My, my, like, my sole goal in life is to sort of save the world one little black child at a time is what I used to say. Um, but part of that is once these people you know, matriculate out of these fancy institutions and are now looking for positions, like how can I, you know, how can I help? How can I support? And BDN is, is, has really been beneficial for that. So uh, I appreciate being a part of the organization. I see my role as a bridge between the Black Talktoral Network and the lovely, fantastic postdocs and grad students who are in the group, who are trying to find positions, and this perch on which I sit, which is the University of California, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, public uh, institution of higher education in the country. And so, there you go. You know, I didn't get an uh, opportunity to answer the question about the um, HBCU and PWI. And, you know, I've worked at six different PWIs. I never worked at an HBCU. But when I think of the Black Doctoral Network and um, my affiliation, my membership, and attending the conferences, what it has done for me is the skills, the knowledge, and the ability that I have obtained from my institutions with all the training that I've received, I've been able to sew that back, right? So meeting people, I've met people at the conferences and because I serve on the promotion and tenure committee at my institution, I know what they're looking for. And so now I'm helping other people who are trying to get promoted at their institution because sometimes we stay assistant professors forever and we could be promoted to associate professor and then to a full professor, right? And understanding the importance of that, getting having partnerships with writing papers so that I can have my scholarship so I can go up for promotion, having um, opportunities to present with each other at conferences, right? National conferences, regional conferences, and working with each other. And it has been great with this virtual stuff going on. It has been great to connect with individuals in the Black Doctoral Network and um, partner with them on stuff so that I can get promoted, they can get promoted. We're helping each other and uplifting each other, right? To be able to do that in different disciplines. We're in different disciplines and we're writing papers together. We're presenting at conferences. We are doing it. And these are individuals that I met at the Black Doctoral Network. If I didn't go there, I mean, it's so lovely, all the Black people. I'm like, oh, my people here, my people. You know, and I don't have to pretend I can just, well, you know, I'm my authentic self anyway. You can tell right now that I'm just who I am. But even more so the comfort that I feel when I go there, just connecting with people. I, I'm going to try to go next because um, I get emotional when I talk about the Black Doctoral Network. I have deep, deep love for the Black Doctoral Network. I, I, was, I started my PhD program over a decade ago, and I was in the program for nine and a half years. I had no idea it was going to be a program that long. It, it had a devastating effect on me. It had a devastating effect on my family. It was a horrible process. And yes, like like uh, Dr. Boyd, I'd rather have Alpha Wood than have the doctoral process. I really would. Please beat me. Please beat me. Because it, that, was a, that, that was a better experience for me. You know, um, I, I started tearing up thinking about answering the question. You know, 
I remember my very first conference where I walked in the door and I was a brand new PhD student and, and, and an old PhD student. And I was welcomed like I was 20 years old. You know, I remember the first time I presented my research and, and I had been told on my campus that my research wasn't important. I wasn't a good scholar. I wasn't that smart. You know, and I didn't know I needed to be told those things. You know, so I was told all these things to make me humble. And when I went to the Black Doctoral Network in my fifth year and in my in my ninth year. Right. You know, because my, my chair quit right before I right before I defended, you know, so I was at the Black Toro Network and they said to me, all of them, especially Mr. Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew, I'll mention you every time, especially Mr. Andrew, what is your head doing down? We are so proud of you. We are so proud of you. At lunch, people told me how they're proud they was. At the at the at the at the recruiting tables, people told me how proud they were of me. I saw other people who need to be lifted up like that. Um, I tell people if I ever if I ever hit hit the lottery, half of it go no, not half, but a lot goes to the Black Doctoral Network. You know, um, the work you're doing is so important. And for those of you who are new to the Black Doctoral Network, don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. Follow it all around the country because when you get back, we get back face to face. Uh, put your coins together and come join us. That's the space for you. Like like um, someone else said on the panel, I didn't go to an HBCU, so I didn't have that experience. But I but I had a deep fellowship with African American people, with Latino people, with Asian people, with people who were marginalized. And at the Black Doctoral Network, I went in I went in that room and said, okay, well they get it right. And so I'm always going to be the big supporter. I I have nothing. I have I I can't I I love you guys like I love my child. You know, and my child is watching. She's gonna be like, "Really? I, really?" Except for I, I pay for everything for you. <laughs> so, all right, all right. Thank you, guys, for letting me talk. Uh, for me, it, it's family, and it's been family since day one. Um, I remember my first conference, and I said, "Oh my lord, uh, why have I I not been already doing this? Like it should have already been a part of my my routine." And I used my energy, you know, the energy I felt. And I said, I'm bringing another colleague. And so I never forget attending the conference. And she is a dear sister friend of mine, uh, Dr. Anika Simone Johnson. She and I was like having the, the time of our lives at the conference, making connections with everybody. And it has been routine. Like it's just been a part of what we do. Um, our conversations are so much richer because of the connections that we have with uh, the Black Doctoral Network. And one of the biggest pieces that I think is important to really highlight is that the BDN is a net that works, right? So it's not about just giving the lip service to say, oh, we're collaborative. It's uh, a great opportunity to have, you know, a directory of individuals, all of the, you know, the really bougie-fied, and I'm just using that word, that's me. I'm going to own that for right now. Um, the bougie-fied way of saying, oh, yes, you can go to this honey, it's family. It's just family. We just go in, we just be ourselves. We, we get the love, we get the encouragement that we need, especially when we're going through our doctoral processes. Um, and then also just really taking hold of, you know, the other opportunities that come with that, right? The, the job opportunities, just the kind of the listening ear for, hey girl, you can submit a paper to this publication because you're going to get, you know, there's going to be some more visibility for the work that you're really um, interested in. So it's for family for me. That's just, it's just all love. <laughs> and everybody there is beautiful. Everybody there is beautiful. I, I love going to the conference because I love that night we all dress up and just look good. And we look good like, like we look good. I took my wife the last time and she hadn't been before. And it was in New Jersey. It wasn't the biggest conference, but we look good. We look good. We look good. We, and, and everybody's beautiful. Everybody's brilliant. And I learned from everybody there. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. There's nothing wrong with the BBM. Nothing wrong with the BBM. Um, Hello? Can you all hear me? I think we had a connectivity issue on my end. But um, thank you all for those wonderful things that you said about the Black Doctoral Network because this is why we're here, this is why we do it, and you all are, are showing 
the audience members why this organization is what it is because of individuals like you. And I just wanna say thank you a thousand times plus for all that you do and you continue to do in this conversation. I mean, this is by far a wonderful start to 2021, a wonderful start to Black History Month and you all as African-American innovators, scholars, researchers, there cannot be anything less than to say thank you and continue to say thank you in all that you do. So, But nonetheless, this concludes our episode of Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists who have taken time out of their busy schedules. As you've heard, all the stressors and factors that they have to deal with to take time out and educate myself as well as the audience in regards to how important diversity and inclusion is in the academic setting. So I just want to say thank you again. So before we go, I want you all just to share a bit of your contact information on how the audience can get in touch with you to reach out and have this conversation on a more elaborate scale. Uh, Dr. Mitchell. Hi, I'm um, working both at Slippery Rock and Edinburgh. You can contact me though, mostly through my Edinburgh email, tamitchell at edinburgh.edu. And I have an Instagram site, uh, cdio underscore Edinburgh U. Um, and I also have a small nonprofit, uh, creedonline.org. Visit them too. And uh, if you want to, drop a couple of dollars in. <laughs> Always got to put in for the green. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stapp. Hi, you can reach me at uh, my LinkedIn, v Dr. Vicki T. Sapp. You can also reach me through Deal With It Management as well as Mentor First Gen. And I believe they're putting that in. I didn't give them the Mentor First Gen, but you can look it up. I know you have the skills to be able to do that. Mentor First Gen. I see Dr. Anika Simone Johnson, my partner, and that is she just put a um, comment up. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Dr. Horton. So I am um, at UC Davis and my email should be up there. It's dlhorton at ucdavis.edu. Or uh, I run an or I created an organization called Black Girl Doctorate. So if you are a woman or a femme identified non-binary non individual um, who is looking for some community, uh, I encourage you to go to blackgirldoctorate.com. And from there, it will take you to the Facebook page. Um, we would be happy to have you. We're actually having a happy hour, which is really not a happy hour because you know how black people are. It's basically a party on Zoom <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. So if you take yourself over there, uh, click the link, it's free. You just come and hang out and decompress. Thank you. Dr. Campbell. You can uh, reach me uh, via LinkedIn or any of the social media uh, platforms, including Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Um, and pretty soon I'll have a new website called uh, www.ashleynicolephd.com. Thank you. Wonderful. And Dr. Boyd. You can find me at the University of New Haven. My email is lboyd at newhaven.edu. I also have a pretty uh, strong social media presence. So if you Google me, you'll find me. All right. <laughs> thank you. Um, again, thank you panelists for this wonderful, enlightening conversation this evening. And to our audience members, if you've enjoyed Conversation Starters and would like to keep up to date with the latest BDN developments, please be sure to check us out on blackphdnetwork.org, become a member, and follow us on Facebook at Black Doctoral Network. I'm your moderator, Fesse Longe, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a nice evening. <laughs>